Cody, I'm part-time, you know, should I really do it? Should I really go for it? Uh, what's unique about you is you're making 60, 70 K a year, you know, five, six grand a month, solid income and above average income. Um, you know, maybe not in Connecticut, but in, especially in Missouri. Uh, but just in general, you freaking went for it. You know, you, you saw the potential. You're probably someone that, you know, sports background, all that, obviously I've, I've, I've heard, and I want you to share at some point too is, uh, but just in general, you're probably someone that's like, if he's doing it, I can do it, you know? And so uh, talk about that a little bit, because to, to be able to pull the trigger and go for it, um, if you took a disc assessment, you'd probably be at a uh, uh, high D, high I, you know? I'm just guessing. Yeah, I mean, for me it was like, I, so just to kind of even backpedal a little bit further, like I, I, I've always been obsessed with, I've always wanted to be in the special forces. That was something I've always wanted to do. And um, my wife knew that's what I was, you know, she knew that about me when we met. And I was actually planning on leaving to go and do that. I had done all my tests and everything and gotten to where I'd, probably one of my biggest regrets in life was not being in the military. I just, I just, I just, I just love it. I love, I just love our, our, our military and, yep. and, um, and I've got buddies that serve. And so um, there's just something about it that I just, I've always been really, really drawn to. I think it's that sense of team, that sense of community, that sense of just uh, the, the, the competitive nature of it. Um, and, you know, the fact that a lot of folks said, you know, that, that, you know, there's only so many that make it, that, that was always very intriguing to me. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we were starting to have a young family, um, kind of, kind of sat down and realized that this probably wasn't, probably wasn't going to be the best thing. Um, if, if I was going to be a family man to, to go and pursue that dream. So, you know, my biggest passion in life is I've always known I've wanted to help a lot of people. You know, I, I want to be able to provide for my family in the manner that's best in the best interest of our family, not based on what's in our account, you know, what we want to do. I want to be able to help my parents out who, who were kind of in a tight situation. Um, I want to be able to give back to my, my outer circle. So it's like I had a buddy of mine who had a cancer benefit a few years back and was able to donate like 500 bucks. And I'm just like, how can I get to the point where I can donate 5,000, 15,000, 20,000? So for me, it was like I, what I was doing at that moment in time, I knew wasn't going to be able to fulfill all my passions. I thought that I, if I did like the military, that would fulfill my, um, you know, that, that I could make some sort of tangible difference. But this is the next best avenue that I've found to be able to do that. From an income standpoint, it's not about money to me. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's like money's just paper. It's, but it's what you can do with it, you know, to be able to give back in a massive way. And like I measure everything on like the rocking chair test. If I'm 75, 80, 85 years old and looking back on my life, reflecting upon my life, I want to know that I made some sort of difference. Mm. So for shifting over from part-time to full-time, when, when I saw the potential, I, I immediately recognized that this was, a, this was an avenue that would allow me to truly fulfill my passion uh, and really achieve my why. And so, um, and, then I, and then once I dove in, at that point, it was, I'm just like, I'm 110% into whatever I'm doing at that moment in time. So at that time, it was insurance. I'm 110% in. I'm not going to fail. What am I going to do? Quit on my wife and kids? Right. Like it's not an option. And you know, I think success becomes really easy when, when failure really isn't an option. You know, you get back into a corner and, and uh, it's me. It's like, how far can I get ahead of everything? How far, my, how, far, how far I can get ahead of my lead bill, my personal bills. Like I want to get so far ahead. Like I'm not, I got, you know, I'm sure you're a football fan. Like I don't want to be up uh, in the NFL. I don't want to be, a, I don't want to be up, you know, two scores at the half, three scores at the half. Like anything can happen in an NFL football game. Like I want to be up like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 scores. I've always kind of taken that approach with everything that I've done. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and the transition from full-time to part-time, I don't, initially it was very part-time, very, very half-heartedly, you know, working a weekend here and there. But then as I was approaching full-time, it was really, my part-time schedule was probably similar to a lot of folks' full-time schedule. You know, I think like, uh, it's like a buddy of mine, Eric Schmidt, who came over from the car business, was in the car business for 23, 24 years. He was working about 50, 60 hours a week, making 180, 190 grand, to, uh, you know, uh, a year over there, but, but not able to spend a lot of time with his family. Um, I mean, the dealership basically owned him. But uh, when he transitioned, he knew he wanted to get out and he saw what I was doing. And he, when he wasn't at the dealership on that transition, I mean, he was still running, he was able to run 15 appointments a week. Like, so when he wasn't at the dealership, he was running part-time. So like everyone's definition of part-time. For me, like if you're going to do it part time, you definitely have to be able to get in front of 
you got to get in front of a bunch of families right away to know if it's something that's going to be for you or not. Is there anything else you guys want to add as someone that I view as an influencer in our industry, looking to help people, looking to, you know, maybe from a, from a podcast, personal brand, um, content perspective, anything else you guys want to add some final tips for anybody that's looking to do something like that? Well, I, I think you've got to get your, you know, figure out what you're good at, first of all. And, um, you know, put a lot of content out on social media and do it in a way that has zero expectation of anything in return, but just wanting to help people. And that doesn't, you know, I, I've been, I've been do, saying this for a year now, but if I had it to do over again, I love Bradley so much and I do anything for him but I would have probably started a podcast in the niche markets that we sell commercial insurance mm -hmm. because instead of, you know, the way we did this is really mind numbing in the fact that we're, we're just talking to other insurance agents. Yeah. If, if, if I was going to get in the podcasting world and I was in the insurance space, I would be talking to about, my niche market, whatever it was that I was but selling. Here's the key with that. Like, don't, you know, don't do a pod. If your niche is apartments, don't do a podcast about apartment insurance. Mm -hmm. Do a podcast about apartments. Right. Bring influential people in. Right. And a byproduct of that is they're going to, look, we do a podcast to the insurance industry. I sell insurance from that podcast. Right. You know, um, somebody asked me the other day, like Bradley, you know, social media is great, but like, I don't really think you can sell commercial insurance on the PC side. I'm like, dude, do a podcast in Roanoke, Virginia, wherever you are, the Roanoke business podcast, interview other business people about their business. Yeah. Video it, record it. You've got your podcast. You've got your video, not to mention 80 little one minute clips you can put out there. Okay. Other business owners, are going to watch it. They're going to know your name. The business owner you interviewed is mm -hmm. going to feel guilted into letting you quote their commercial insurance. If you ask for a deck page, after you've given them free advertising, other businesses are going to reach out to you. Swear to God, this is going to happen. Yeah. Other businesses are going to reach out to you and they're going to say, Hey Bradley, can I really please, can you interview me on your podcast? It'd be great advertising for your business. Yeah, Rick, the cost is I need your deck page. Mm. You will sell commercial insurance on Facebook, on social yeah. media. Like, why does, why, I mean, you know, so, and why am I not doing that? Yeah, I know, right? So, you, you talked really quick there about uh, how to pivot, keep control of the conversation, move it where you want to go. That's one thing I, I also believe a lot in is, is in phone sales is the person in control, um, you know, not from a jerk standpoint, but just in control of the conversation is definitely going to get farther if you're able to keep control of it. And, you know, and it doesn't mean you have to talk a lot, right? Because you can, you can let them talk and them feel like they're dominating the conversation and they're sharing, which is what you want them to do, but you're able to just pivot and, and, and steer like you talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and here's the thing, if you're in the sales game, you know, and I think that sometimes it gets painted negatively, the, the idea that we're salespeople and that we are doing certain techniques to, to try to control the conversation. Well, well, that's our job. Our job as the subject matter as experts is to control the conversation, is to make sure that we're going down the right avenue and not chasing uh, uh, going down a bunch of rabbit holes. So I don't think there's any problem at all with with doing the right thing in terms of asking the, con asking the questions necessary to steer them in the direction of providing the correct information for that consumer situation. Uh, so we do that exact same thing that you're talking about. Uh, Cody, you were probably actually the first person that taught us that. Um, you, you, you say it differently. Say it again. It's, it's ask. Yeah, yeah. Agree, answer, and ask. Yeah. Agree, answer, and ask. And so I also, it was, it was reinforced by a book called The Conversion Code that another buddy recommended. And there, and there they call it acknowledge, respond, pivot, meaning the exact same thing, right? But it's so powerful because that's what needs to happen. Anytime somebody brings up an objection over the phone, you need to acknowledge their objection. You need to acknowledge that you're actively listening. You hear it. You respond to that objection with an answer, some hopefully that's been well rehearsed so that you have a good, a good way of controlling. And then you go ahead and pivot with asking another question that continues directing the conversation the way you want it to go.
tell us about uh, for a quick second um digital life insurance agent mastermind the, yeah. it, was, it was in vegas right yeah last it was uh, earlier this year in vegas we had about 120 agents um it's a two-day thing we're planning our next one for next april or may and um yeah what we do is we just get agents in the trenches we're not getting any carriers to speak we're not getting any um anybody that's going to try and sell you something on stage everybody needs to provide yeah. value uh, we prefer agents in the trenches that are very successful and so you kind of learn like the ins and outs and really it's just a place to connect with other digital life insurance agents we're such a small niche and we get mm -hmm. I mean, and people take cracks at the digital life insurance space all the time, face-to-face -face agents saying how it doesn't work, how your persistency is terrible, how X, Y, you know, and it's just one of those things where we know what it really is. We're all going to hang out. We just have a great time. You know, we, it's, it's basically a two-day party with a ton of value. <laughs> That's awesome. It's, That's cool. Yeah. You know what, you know what I love about that is, and, and the same thing for 8% is bringing those online relationships offline, you know, exactly. and I've learned like even getting to know you over the last couple of years, it's, it's been, uh, it's been incredible. The people you meet, you know, because of conferences and events and things, masterminds, things you can do in general. Uh, it's just, I'm learning that it is small. Networking is important. I used to ignore it, but man, um, I love, I'm enjoying socializing you know, people. I always leave the valuable nuggets, you know, uh, yeah. I think it's great. Absolutely. Um, I mean, building community is, is everything. I mean, we're, as life insurance agents, we're at home working by ourselves, you know? Yeah. To be able to get with people and talk to people that are doing what you're doing and, uh, and learning from each other, you know? Getting out of that, that bubble, um, picking up new, new skills and new insights is just is worth it. I mean, I always tell people it's not the, yeah, you're gonna get a ton of value from the speakers, but it's those, those sidebar conversations where somebody is just going to leave you a nugget and uh, you're, it's just going to change the way you do your business.